It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Gigabyte M32U. The OSD is controlled by a joystick at the rear of the monitor. There's also a KVM keyboard video mouse button just above that. So if you press the KVM button, it will cycle the input used by the monitor and will reassign USB peripherals connected to the monitor to a different system depending on how you set it up in the KVM wizard. If you press the joystick in, you'll see this little quick menu thing comes up. Press the joystick right to access KVM multitask, and you can access the switch that way if you want to as well, by then pressing the joystick right, which is select. And you can set it up with the KVM wizard. And again, I press the joystick right to get further into the menu or enter. So here you're saying, what display signal are you using for the system that's also connected with USB-B? That's the main USB upstream port of the monitor, which is labeled SS, super speed at the back. And then for your Type-C display, so which display signal are you using for the system connected to the USB Type-C port, which also supports upstream data? So you can use Type-C for everything, the display signal and the upstream data, and also gives you a little bit of power delivery, just 18 watts on this model. Or you can have that with HDMI 1, HDMI 2, or DisplayPort. DisplayPort just grayed out because I've assigned that to USB-B. So you see there on the wizard, it just gives you a little quick thing to say, USB-B is assigned to DisplayPort, Type-C is assigned to Type-C. You can also disable the KVM switch if you don't want to press the button. You don't ever use this functionality by just selecting off there. You can't assign it to another function though, it just disables the button. It'd be nice if you could change it to something else that you do use. And KVM reset, which will just reset all of this to the factory defaults. If you twiddle the joystick up, down, left or right before you've actually entered the main menu system, or before you've pressed it in, you can access these little quick settings which you can customize in the OSD. So I'm just going to show you how you customize them. It's called quick switch here in the system section of the OSD. You can say what it's going to do when you twiddle the joystick up, down, left or right. So I've just got it set to brightness for up and down because I adjust that quite a lot when I'm reviewing the monitor. Right and left, that's picture mode because that's another thing I tend to adjust when I'm reviewing the monitor. I also switch between the custom presets for various different reasons and I'll come to that shortly. But you can see there are various options you can set these to. So there's brightness, contrast, input, volume, black equalizer, aim stabilizer, sync, picture mode, and KVM switch. If you press the joystick in, you'll see again, there's KVM multitask, which I went through just before. If you then press the joystick up, you would select setting, which is the main menu system. To the right is game assist, and down is power off. You can also power the monitor off by holding the joystick in for a couple of seconds. And if the monitor goes into standby and you can't access that little quick menu and you want to power the monitor off, you would just hold it in again for a few seconds. So I'm going to go through Game Assist quickly. So this has Game Info, which at the moment is off the screen. So you can change the info location, the left side of the screen or the right side of the screen, the top, center or the bottom. So at least if it's here, you can see it on the video. That is helpful. So I'll just leave it there. So there's a timer, which is the top bit there, and that will count up or down depending on what you select. There's gaming counter, which will count up when certain key presses are made. And you can figure that with OSD Sidekick, which I'll show you very shortly, the software, which is used to control this kind of thing. And you can also use it for various other things. I will come on to that shortly. Refresh rate. I'll just show you this on its own, actually, because it's quite useful. So this shows the current refresh rate of the display. And if you're using adaptive sync, so that could be AMD FreeSync, or it could be NVIDIA G-Sync, or it could be HDMI 2.1 VRR. You'll see this changes to reflect the frame rate of the content. If you don't have VRR active, it's just going to display the static refresh rate that you've selected. There's an on-screen crosshair function. There's Style 1, Custom 1, Custom 2, and Custom 3. You customize these with OSD Sidekick, as you might have guessed. So this just puts a crosshair in the center of the screen. You can't control where it is. It's always in the center of the screen, as shown there. And there's also dashboard. I'm just going to change the dashboard location so you can actually see it. This populates if you're using OSD Sidekick, otherwise it won't. So I'm just going to open up OSD Sidekick. And there's a link to download OSD Sidekick in the description of the video. You need the USB upstream cable connected to the system when you're using OSD Sidekick. So that's the one labeled SS, the USB B port of the monitor. You have to connect that to your system. That would be a Windows PC you have to connect it to. So I'll run through this properly in a little bit, but I just wanted to show you the dashboard. You can see it only has location up and down there. You can't have it 
over at the right side of the screen as you can adjust with the OSD, which is a little bit annoying. So some of the features in the OSD Sidekick aren't quite the same as you can get in the main OSD. So there we are, I've got it where I wanted it. And it should shortly populate, yeah, with different things. This isn't always gonna show, it depends on your system, it depends on your peripherals and what they support, which readings they'll give you. But you see, there are various different things there. And finally here, there is display alignment. And that just gives you some little markers around the image to help you align multiple displays. So onto the main menu now, that's setting. First section, gaming, aim stabilizer sync. This is a strobe backlight mode. And if I activate this, you'll just see the screen flicker, so I'm not gonna bother doing that. But this is all explored in the written review. There's black equalizer, you can change that between zero and 20 and 10 is the default setting. I've got legom.nl, the website open, the black levels test. This won't appear as it does to the eye, but it will allow me to show you what the setting does. So 10 is the default. If you raise this, it will increase your black depth and also the depth of darker shades. So you do lose contrast if you increase this because pure black gets lighter. Ideally that wouldn't happen. So this isn't very selective. And if you decrease this below 10, it doesn't improve your black depth at all, it doesn't improve your contrast, it just crushes things together. Depending on preferences, you may like to adjust this, and if you increase it, it's designed to give you an edge in competitive gaming, that kind of thing, make enemies easier to spot against the background, that kind of thing. Next up, there is super resolution, and this is set to zero by default. This is a sharpness enhancement filter or sharpness filter. It basically over sharpens the image. This can be useful if you're running a non-native resolution perhaps or just according to your own preferences, but I prefer to leave this on zero. Nice neutral setting there. Next you've got display mode and this is greyed out if you've got AMD FreeSync Premium Pro enabled. This enables adaptive sync so it would also enable NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode so you will have display mode greyed out if you're using adaptive sync. And also if you're using HDMI 2.1 VRR, you don't specifically have to select AMD, it's a bit confusing, you don't have to specifically select AMD FreeSync Premium Pro in the OSD because you don't need to use Adaptive Sync for that, but it'll basically act as if that's enabled in the OSD and it will also grey out display scaling setting. So your, your display mode setting, sorry. So you can see full, that will use all pixels of the screen regardless of the source resolution selected. Next is aspect and that will use as many pixels as it can whilst maintaining the correct aspect ratio. Because I'm running at the full native resolution of the screen at the moment, these settings aren't gonna be all that interesting. The first three are gonna be exactly the same. But if I switch over to the WQHD resolution, you should be able to see what this does. So again, aspect, 16 by nine resolution. So it maintains the correct aspect ratio, but it's using interpolation and that's explored in the written review. Next there's one-to-one, -one, and this will look different. That only uses the pixels called for in the source resolution and presents a black border for the rest of the pixels. And there are then various different settings which simulate different screen sizes and aspect ratios. You can use these with a native resolution as well if you want. You don't have to be using a non-native resolution, but I'm just gonna show you these very quickly. So that was 22 inch 16 by 10. There's 23 inch 16 by nine. 23.6 inch 16 by nine. 24 inch 16 by 9 and 27 inch 16 by 9. If you're using VRR then it just uses the default full setting and you can't access display mode as I mentioned before. So the only thing I haven't gone through here is overdrive and that is explored. I'm sure you knew I was going to say this if you've seen my videos before. That is explored in the written review. Also a little bit in the video review for that matter. Next, you've got picture, so that allows you to adjust the presets of the monitor. Regardless of which setting you use, so standard's the default, they just make various different adjustments. So I'm not really gonna go through these in much detail. So this sets, FPS mode sets the brightness to a high level by default, it gives you low gamma, so that will give you a lot of detail in dark areas, helps you competitively perhaps. It makes various different changes and you can just set everything up as you want for different presets and it will be remembered for that preset. There are some settings which aren't remembered universally. 
most notably color temperature. If you set that to user define and you change the red, green and blue color channels manually, that's applied universally. So every time you select user define on a different preset, it will use whatever you've selected here. So you've got RTS RPG, makes different adjustments. You've got movie that makes different adjustments again. Reader, different adjustments. sRGB, this is a different one because it locks off a lot of settings. You can adjust the brightness, but very little else. Also be aware that the overdrive is grayed out with sRGB, and this is an sRGB emulation setting which clamps the gamut close to sRGB, and it's explored in the written review. Also note that the overdrive is set to Smart OD, and you can't change that, and that is not the best setting as I explore in the written review. You've then got Custom 1, Custom 2, Custom 3. These are just additional fully customizable settings. I set these up myself so that Custom 1, that's my main test settings, Custom 2, that's my relaxing evening viewing settings, and Custom 3 has local dimming active, but it's the same as my test settings otherwise. That's just so I can test that feature specifically for the review. Go through some of the options here. Brightness, contrast, six axis color, so you can change the red, green, and blue channels, the hue and saturation. Most users, you won't want to adjust this. Just to, You can adjust it according to preferences if you like. What I would say is if you're trying to slightly reduce the saturation, to get things perhaps looking a little bit more like sRGB. It's quite difficult to achieve that, even with red, green, blue, and sorry, I should have scrolled down because there's also cyan, magenta, and yellow. Even with this level of control, it is difficult to get the balance right. You'll find that some shades appear still quite saturated and others start appearing really quite obviously undersaturated. So it is difficult to get the balance right, but you can adjust according to preferences. If you increase the saturation levels, things start getting crushed together because you're pulling things closer to the edge of the gamut without expanding the gamut itself. So again, just according to preferences, but most users probably don't want to touch this. And I'll just show you the hue shift because I know people aren't always familiar with this control. So that's the red hue being increased and now decreased. So it really just can make the image look very funky. I know some people, perhaps for their work, might like to make some slight adjustments here, or just according to their own preferences, but generally speaking, no need to adjust this. There's then color vibrance, that's set to 10 by default. If you increase this, it's very much like you're just increasing all of the channels for saturation with six axis color. And again, it crushes things together. You start losing shade variety. You can adjust that according to your own preferences though, or you can decrease it a little bit if you want lower saturation. This then is sharpness control. You can set this between zero and 10. Five's the default, good neutral level. You might like to increase it a little bit perhaps for non-native resolutions or just according to your own preferences. You might want to adjust this a little bit. Everyone has their own preferences of the sharpness. I do appreciate that. And you can adjust it here. Gamma, various different settings, off 1.8, 2.0, 2.2, 2.4, and 2.6, all explored in the review. And on my unit, they did actually correspond to what it says there. Off is quite similar, or was on my unit to, I believe it was 2.0. I might be a bit wrong there, but you can see in the calibration section of the written review. Color temperature. So you've got user define, which I went through just before. You can set the red, green, and blue color channels manually. And there's warm, which gives a warm tint to things. And that actually acts as a quite effective low blue light setting. Again, I explore this in the vision review. There's normal, which is just the factory default, and it's the same as having user defined set to 100 for everything, or it was on my unit. And there's cool, which gives a cool tint, a high white point. There's DCR, dynamic contrast ratio, also explored in the written review in the contrast section, just below the contrast table. This is a dynamic contrast mode. There's local dimming, which you can activate under SDR or HDR, and you guessed it, I explore that quite a lot in the review, so I'm not gonna go through that here. And this reset picture, which will reset the picture settings to the factory defaults. Just before moving on, I'm gonna quickly go through the settings available to you in HDR. So if you've got HDR enabled, things do change. I'm just going to show you a section from the video review which covers this. So under HDR, you'll see picture mode, now it says HDR. 
Well, you might not be able to see that, depends on the camera, it can flood this out, but it says HDR there. You can adjust overdrive, you can use AMD FreeSync Premium Pro, this means you can use adaptive sync, so you can use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode, which is the one I'm using at the moment, at the same time as HDR, or you can use AMD FreeSync if you've got a compatible AMD GPU or system at the same time as HDR. You can adjust the overdrive setting, unlike the sRGB emulation setting, which locked that off. And in picture in HDR, there are various different settings here. You can't adjust the brightness, but there are things with enhance after it. I'm just going to go through these quickly. Under HDR, you're supposed to be following metadata in a very specific way. So as a purist, I don't like this kind of adjustment. You shouldn't touch it. But if you prefer how things look, by all means do this. So light enhance, you see that just sort of brightens the image up a lot. And again, I can see, you know, the appeal. Some people might prefer this look. And also be aware that what you see on the camera, it doesn't look as it would to the eye. So actually, it looks a lot more natural with that set to zero. I certainly prefer it anyway. There's color enhance. It's a bit more subtle, I guess, but it's a saturation boost. It's now oversaturated things, so even the green of the vegetation there, completely out of whack. There's dark enhance, that's just on or off. And that really just lifts up the dark detail and makes things look rather flooded, to be honest. Again, this is really not what you want under HDR. And there's local dimming. You've then got display, input, so you can change the input used by the monitor. RGB range, you can set that to auto detect, which I'd recommend most people use, but if you want to enforce a limited range signal, that's RGB 16 to 235. If you want to enforce and make sure a standard range signal is being used on the monitor, RGB 0 to 255, but you still have to set it up appropriately on your system. This doesn't change what the system is outputting, it's just what the monitor is gonna be using. There's overscan, it basically makes the image flow off the screen. It's not something that most people are going to want to use, but I know for certain games it could give a competitive edge perhaps because it uh, sort of enlarges things a little bit. And for older systems, you might want to use that. I have a strange feeling it might be greyed out if you're using VRR. I'm just going to check that because I haven't checked this yet. So I've just enabled VRR and it is indeed greyed out. So it might be a bit difficult to see on the video, but it's just greyed out over scan below RGB range and I can't select it anymore. Next up, you've got PIP, P by P, picture in picture, picture by picture. So for picture in picture, you can see that part of the screen is showing a secondary source, the rest is showing my primary source. I don't have another thing connected, which is why that's just a nice black box, a little bit boring for you there. But you can select the source which is used for that little box. You can change the size of that little box so it's even more little or even littler, so small, medium or large. You can change the location corners of the screen there. You can switch it over so the primary and secondary sources are swapped. And there's audio switch which allows you to select where the audio is going to be coming from, your main or your sub-source. And for PVP, picture by picture, largely the same, except that it's a side-by-side -side representation. You can change the mode so it maintains the aspect ratio or you can have it so it fills up as much of the screen as possible and ignores the aspect ratio, but it's only ever going to fill up half of the screen. Because I'm using a 16 by 9 resolution, it's uh, actually, it's just squashed things, so it's using half of the screen, but it's managed to not distort it too much. Sometimes on monitors it looks a little bit more weird than this. It's actually done fairly well there. As you can tell, this isn't something I really use myself or have a massive amount of experience with, but I've definitely seen this looking rather weird compared to how it does here on some monitors. And again, there's display switch and audio switch, just like there was with PIP. Next, you've got system. There's audio, which allows you to change the volume, or you can mute the integrated speakers or anything connected to the 3.5 millimeter jack if you're using that. OSD settings, display time, so that's how long after the last button press before the OSD will automatically disappear. You can change the transparency level of the OSD. OSD lock. So if you enable this, and you try and use the joystick, it now just says the button is locked, confirm to unlock OSD. So it's a pretty straightforward unlock on that one. There's also OSD size, so that's actually set to X2. I didn't even look at this before, I didn't even realize you could do this, because I should have mentioned really, everything looks quite enlarged, so this has a very tight pixel density, this monitor. So X2 enlarges things, and some of the graphics in the OSD look a little bit sort of cruddy because of that. But if you don't mind things looking smaller, you can select times one, and now you can see that 
menu there is much smaller, so things are a little bit sharper. They're still quite basic icons, to be honest, so it's never going to look amazing, but it's just something you can change. And now I go into the OSD and things are smaller and sharper. It just depends on your preferences. For the sake of this video, actually, I'm pretty glad it is on X2. It makes it a little bit easier to see. So I'm just going to change that back. You then got Quick Switch, which I went through towards the start of the video. There's other settings. Resolution notice, that will just display a little notice on the screen when a non-native resolution is being used to remind you of that. Input auto switch, so you can have the monitor automatically select the input for you, or if you really want to be manually selecting this yourself, then you can have auto switch off here. Auto power off, quite useful actually, I'm just going to leave this on. Set to 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes or off, and this means that when the monitor is no longer receiving a signal, it will just turn off as if you press the power button after 10, 20 or 30 minutes. LED indicator. So there's a little power LED, that white thing towards the bottom right. It's actually quite bright on this monitor. So if you find it annoying, you can just turn it off. So it's always off or you can have it standby on, which means it will blink white when the monitor's on standby, but otherwise it will be off. The standby charge, so if you want to be able to charge things connected via USB, you can have that set to on. If you have it set to on, and even if you're not using the USB ports, not charging things, this will increase the power draw of the monitor slightly. So it's why it's set to off by default. Type C compatibility, you can have this on or off. Let me just check the manual. So here we can check the manual together. It says type C compatibility, compat with device. Okay, so compatible with device, which does not support DSC when turn this option into on. Not the best English, but I think you get the idea. Just if you're using an older system, USB-C that doesn't have DSC support, and switch that on. I've also realized I'm not using the native resolution or wasn't for a bit. I was totally engrossed in this video, focusing on the OSD rather than what my system was doing. But just so you're aware, when you change the size of the OSD one times or two times, it doesn't change with the system resolution. Just in case you're wondering, you can see it's now set to 3840 by 2160, and it hasn't changed the size of the OSD. You've got HDMI version, so you can set that to 2.1 or 2.0, so 2.0 would just be for compatibility purposes. The send language, so you can change the language the OSD is displayed in. Various different options there. Save settings, so this saves all of your settings, and this includes your color channel adjustments, by the way, as settings one, settings two, or settings three, so you can save them and recall them later. It doesn't make it very obvious that it's actually saved them, so I can only assume it has. I was expecting a confirmation there. And there's reset all, which will reset everything to the factory defaults. I'm now gonna quickly go through OSD Sidekick, and again, you need the USB upstream port connected. Process is running. Okay, so I already had it open. You can see it in the taskbar here. I've been through this in several of my videos before. I'm just going to change the exposure so you can actually see the text more clearly. That would be quite helpful. There we are. So actually to the eye even, this is, I don't really like this grayed out look. It looks like lots of things can't be selected even though they can. I don't really like that they've done it like this. It becomes clearer if you highlight things. But you can see there are various different options here. It doesn't offer absolutely everything that the OSD offers. And also be aware that if you've got the OSD open at the same time and you're trying to make adjustments in the OSD and also in Sidekick, it can get a little bit confusing because they don't always switch on both systems. So you can sort of lose track of the adjustments you're making. So if you're actively using OSD Sidekick, I would recommend don't change things in the OSD too much if you can help it. You can see there are various different presets here, but it doesn't have custom one, custom two, and custom three, which is actually quite annoying. They're the ones I like to use. I think many people quite like to use them. That's why they're there, but you can't select them in OSD Sidekick. It is selected anyway, custom one, even though it doesn't say this, but if I select standard here, for example, I then can't go back to my custom one without going into the OSD. A little bit annoying. Esports Customize, this allows you to save your settings to a profile, then load them later, or even load them on a different system. There's hotkey, and that allows you to assign various different functions in the OSD or for the monitor to different hotkeys. There's quite a lot of flexibility here. So you can see you can change things like the timer, the counter, black equalizer, crosshair, increase or decrease brightness, aim stabilizer, volume, increase and decrease that, the counter. So that's the thing I was saying, which counts up if you press certain keys, and that's how you configure it here in OSD Sidekick. Dashboard on or off, you can change the overdrive. 
Oh yes, and the overdrive is a bit weird on this for OSD Psychic. Actually, it's not right at all here. So it says speed, even though I've got picture quality selected. It has quality, balance, and speed. But if we look at the options in the OSD, and I know I said to try not to do this, but it doesn't matter if I'm not actually, if I'm just showing you things and not trying to select something else, but picture quality is what it's calling speed. That's because it's the third option in the OSD. It's also the third option in this little list. Balance would be if you have smart OD selected and quality would be if you had overdrive set to off. Various other options as well. You've got timer, refresh rate, you can have the refresh rate display, which will correspond to the frame rate if you've got VRR in use, super resolution, plus and minus. You can change the picture modes, contrast, sharpness, or low blue light. Now, you might have noticed there wasn't a low blue light setting on this monitor, in fact, so I'm not sure why it lists this. There isn't a low blue light setting on this monitor that's called low blue light. I did briefly mention that there's a warm setting for color temperature, and I actually use this for my own viewing comfort in the evening. It works very well. It is a low blue light setting. It's an effective low blue light setting, but there's nothing called low blue light on this monitor. You can also use these whilst you're in game, by the way. So if you wanted to quickly adjust the brightness, for example, of the screen, you can do that in game as well. You've then got general setting. You can change the input, OSD transparency levels, OSD display time, the timeout period. You can change the resolution and the refresh rate. You can also configure your quick switch here. KVM Plus, this just has a nice little visual representation of how you've got KVM set up. So for USB-B system, you can change the input used. And the same for your Type-C system. You'll see I've changed that to HDMI 1. I can have USB-B used for my Type-C system if I like. So you don't have to have USB-C for everything. And then you can press KVM switch to switch between these two. There's then About, and this allows you to upgrade the firmware. So you can download the file, you can press Browse, and then Update. So it gives you your current firmware version, which for my unit is F07, which was the newest available at the time of review. And it also gives you some information about the build date and the model name, M32U. So that's really all there is to OSD Sidekick and indeed the OSD of the Gigabyte M32U. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.